Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, uh, Yorkshire uh, Durham Geometry Day. So we uh, are very happy to have uh, Martin Karin from uh, the National University of Ireland, uh, Galway. So actually, Martin was uh, for many years in Münster in Germany. So that's we're colleagues there. So it's uh, it's, it's uh, we're very happy to have him talk. <laughs> In this, uh, in this session. So he will talk about a, a potpourri of non-negatively curved seven manifolds. So. Thank you very much for the introduction, Fernando, and thank you and the other organizers for the, the invitation and the opportunity to give a talk at this, at this nice one day meeting. Um, unfortunately, I can't join you in person in Durham, which I was very much looking forward to, but you know, it is what it is. So, as you said, I want to talk about non-negatively curved seven manifolds, and everything I say is joint work with Sebastian Goethe and uh, Ravi Shankar. And um, just as some basic motivation about non-negative cur curvature, um, it's of course one of the most fundamental concepts in, in Romanian geometry. As soon as you define a metric, the first interesting invariant is a sectional curvature, and then it's natural to talk about sectional curvatures with a sign. And yet there aren't very many, many um, general results known. One of the few is the famous Sol theorem of Chigler and Clomol, which says that if you have a non-compact, non-negatively curved manifold, then it is diffeomorphic to the normal bundle of a closed, totally geodesic submanifold that's called the Sol. And of course, this Sol inherits the curvature properties of the ambient space. And so in some sense, it says that the only interesting spaces to look at in non-negative curvature are the closed ones. And yet these aren't very well understood at all in terms of uh, topological properties or even examples. And one of the problems is that there are very few constructions of these objects. And one of the main reasons why there are so few constructions is that we're not smart enough to come up with uh, tools. Namely, all of the constructions that I'm aware of at least depend on two basic facts. The first is that Riemannian submersions are curvature non-decreasing. So remember that a Riemannian submersion is a submersion that is an isometry orthogonal to the fibers. And being curvature non-decreasing means that if you have non-negative curvature upstairs, then you automatically get it in, on the target space without doing any computations. And that's always a good thing. And the second basic fact that gets used all the time is that compact Lie groups admitted by invariant metric. And I'm sure many of you did the same exercise that I did the first time you encountered sectional curvature and computed the uh, curvature of a by invariant metric, and you know it's always non-negative. So this gets used as well as the as essentially the base case in most constructions in some way, shape, or form. So these two things together are very useful. And uh, the typical strategy for building examples is to find some highly symmetric construction and then try to reduce the symmetry. And this, of course, is used all over mathematics. But in particular, it has met some success in, in the search for non-negatively curved examples. So the most basic example of a, of a non-negatively curved manifold is a homogeneous space, which is, of course, highly symmetric. It has a transitive Lie group action. The whole manifold is a single orbit. And if you want to reduce the symmetry of this, well, sorry, I should say maybe a homogeneous space, of course, is a direct um, um, use of these two facts. So Riemannian submersions, typically these get used when you're taking quotient maps by free isometric group actions, and then you get an induced map on the targets on the, on the quotient space, um, and you impose the curvature in lower bound from upstairs on the, on the orbit space. And so for a homogeneous space, you have a compact Lie group, which has a non-negatively curved by invariant metric. And then you take a quotient by a, a subgroup of the group G. And so you get very easily um, a metric with non-negative curvature on a homogeneous space. So one way of reducing the symmetry from this situation is rather than taking a subgroup of of G, you take a subgroup of G cross G, and then you let the group H act on the group G on both sides. This is very weird, and uh, there's a bit of a lag when I write, so I 
I'm worried that I'm going to make a mess of the writing. So you let it act on both sides. And typically, there are no symmetries left over that are going to commute with the H. You can't, uh, without more information, you can't know it. And if this action happens to be free, then the manifold that you get as a quotient space, oops, that should be an H, it is called a bi-quotient. And this gets non-negative curvature for the same reason as a homogeneous space gets non-negative curvature. So this is one scenario where you get, um, um, you reduce symmetry in some sensible way and you get uh, lots of new examples. So for example, um, Gromo and Meyer in 1974 um, published the first example that I'm aware of in the literature of a bi-quotient. And in that paper, they showed that a certain uh, seven dimensional exotic sphere admits non-negative curvature. And they showed this by showing that um, the sphere can be written as a, as a bi-quotient. So another way you could try to reduce the symmetry um, from the homogeneous setting is saying, rather than have the whole manifold be in orbit, what if an orbit was allowed to have co-dimension one? And this brings you into the setting of co-homogeneity one manifolds. And for me in this talk, I'm only gonna be interested in the case where you have a compact Lie group acting on a closed manifold M, such that the orbit space is a closed interval minus one to one. And the picture, if you haven't seen these things before, that you should have in your head is that the group G rotates your manifold around some axis and uh, the orbit space should be an interval. And from this picture, which is really suggestive, uh, you see that there are two special orbits corresponding to the endpoints of the interval. These are called the singular orbits. And being orbits, you can write them as homogeneous spaces. And so that means they come with some uh, isotropy subgroups, which we call k plus and k minus. So these are typically submanifolds, not just points as in the picture. And between these two singular orbits, you can draw a normal geodesic, which is then an image of this interval in, inside your manifold. And if you take any point along this geodesic, it corresponds to a single orbit. And um, all of the orbits along the interior of this geodesic are diffeomorphic. Um, if the base point that you're choosing for the orbit is on the geodesic, then all of the isotropy groups are actually equal. And so you end up with a nice little algebraic um, group diagram coming from this geometric information. And it's ordered by inclusion. And notice that I've decorated it with some spheres. And the reason I do this is because if you look back at the picture, you see that this a manifold decomposes as the union of two disks over these points, G, the singular points. And in fact, this is a general picture that in a cohomogeneity one manifold, uh, you can decompose as a union of two disk bundles over the singular orbits. And the common boundary is always going to be the so-called principal orbit, G mod H. And the boundary of a disk bundle is of course a sphere bundle. And so these spheres arise as the, uh, the boundary spheres in the, in the disk bundle. So the dimensions of these spheres also encode the co-dimension of the singular orbits. And the nice thing about using this group diagram in the description of the community one manifolds is that it's one-to-one -one correspondence. So you can, if you write down such a diagram, then you can always um, um, construct a community one manifold corresponding to that diagram. So it goes both ways. So what has this got to do with non-negative curvature? Well, a famous result of Kolf and Ziller in 2000 says that if the co-dimensions of the singular orbits are both two, in other words, that the circles in this diagram are both, uh, sorry, the spheres in this diagram are both circles, then you can always build a G invariant metric of non-negative curvature on a manifold. And this turns out to be a very useful result. So let's see. Um, how Gove and Ziller used it in their, uh, in their own paper. So they showed that all principal S3 cross S3 bundles over S4 admit a cohomogeneity one action by S3 cross S3 cross S3 with co-dimension two singular orbits. So here I've included the last two factors in brackets because this is supposed to be um, the principal action, the principal S3 cross S3 action. So um, that action is part of the cohomogeneity one action. 
So what did they do exactly? They started with Comagen 81 exact uh, picture for S4. They um, looked at uh, the group of unicotarians, let it act on S4 in a particular way. And this has a well-known Comagen 81. Um, this is a well-known Comagen 81 action. The, um, the principal isotropic group Q8 is the uh, quaternion 8 group consisting of plus or minus one, plus or minus i, plus or minus j, and plus or minus k. And PIN2 and PIN2 are just two copies of the group PIN2 inside the unicoternions. And PIN2 is a one-dimensional Lie group consisting of two components. The identity component is the circle in the complex plane. And the second component is the image of the circle in the JK plane when you multiply by J. PIN2 is exactly the same, except you just switch the role of I and J. And notice that um, the co-dimension of the singular orbits is two in each case. So even if I didn't know that I could use the round metric for S4, I would know that there's an invariant metric of non-negative curvature on this Comagen 81 manifold, so on S4 in this case. Now, another thing I just want to point out, because it'll come up later, the, uh, sorry, the singular uh, orbits are both copies of RP2. So S3 mod a circle is S2, and you have two components, so quotient out an extra Z mod 2, and so you get RP2. And so this decomposition of S4 is as a union of two two-dimensional disk bundles uh, glued along their common boundary. So that's S4, and then Kohl and Ziller showed that you can actually lift this Comagen 81 action through the principal action, where again, the last two factors in the S3 cross S3 are the principal part of the action. And you do this by spreading the isotropy groups across all three factors. So you spread the principal group Q8, the principal isotropy group Q8 by just taking the diagonal subgroup, and the pin two and pin two, you spread them into the last two factors by giving them some slope. So giving the circle some slope in the last two factors. And the slope depends on some parameters A and B. And notice in particular that the co-dimension of the singular orbits doesn't change. So from their theorem up above, you know automatically that you have a metric with non-negative curvature on each such manifold, Comagen 81 manifold. And they were able to prove that, in fact, you get all possible uh, principal S3 crosses three bundles over S4 by, by this construction. So these all admit non-negative curvature. So that's good. And once you understand principal bundles, the next thing to look at is obviously an associated bundle. And in this case, the, the natural candidate is the um, associated S3 bundle to each one of these principal S3 crosses three bundles. And so you build these by taking the Comagenating one principal bundle, which you know has non-negative curvature. You take the product with the round S3. So this is a non-negatively curved 13 dimensional manifold. And then you quotient out by the structure group, the S3 cross S3. And this is a free isometric um, action. And so you get an induced metric of non-negative curvature on the quotient. So in this way, you get all S3 bundles over S4, admitting a metric with non-negative sectional curvature. And these manifolds have been studied, of course, for a long time. In particular, Milner studied them and discovered um, seven-dimensional exotic spheres. And so a consequence of the Colvin Ziller theorem is that all of the Milner spheres admit a metric with non-negative sectional curvature. So all exotic seven spheres, they can be written as S3 bundles over S4, that admit a metric with non-negative curvature. So how many of these exotic spheres are there and how many of them are bundles? Well, that's a question to which the answer is known. So a combination of work of Milner and Smale in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, showed that there are 28 oriented diffeomorphism types of manifolds homeomorphic to S7. But because we're interested in curvature, we don't really care about the orientation. So you can forget about the orientation. And in that case, there are only 15 um, diffeomorphism types among these manifolds. So how many of them are bundles or can be written as bundles? 
Well, that was resolved by Ings and Kuiper. Soon afterwards, they wrote down topological invariant, which classifies the, um, the homotopy seven spheres up to, oriented, up to orientation preserving diffeomorphism. And a consequence of their invariant is that the Milner spheres account for 11 of the 15 possible diffeomorphism types. So they, there are these four um, non-Milner exotic seven spheres that not much was known about, in particular in, in terms of non-negative sectional curvature, but there weren't even any good um, geometric constructions of these things. So that's one other consequence of our work is that we have a nice geometric construction of these objects as well. So which of the, which of the um, um, exotic seven spheres are the non-Milner ones? Well, these correspond to the elements of Z mod 28, which are plus or minus two mod seven, where the indexing is via the yields kuiper invariant. And here's a list of, of them. Now the eagle-eyed among you will notice that there are more than four here. There are in fact eight, but that's not a problem because they occur in pairs. So these are the same manifold, but with opposite orientations. And you'll see that each of the, um, each of the entries there occurs with its, uh, with its negative in ZMOD 28. So those just indicate the opposite or the change in orientation. So we're gonna show that all of these have a metric with non-negative curvature. And in order to do so, let's dive a little deeper into the, the Kofen-Ziller construction and look at it a, little, a bit more closely. So they built all S3 bundles over S4 as associated bundles to cohomogeneity one principal bundles. But if you look at it a little bit, you can rewrite the fiber here as a homogeneous space, S3 cross S3 mod the diagonal S3. And when you do this, it's very apparent what, what the structure group is doing to the fiber. So it's gonna act transitively on this homogeneous space and the diagonal S3 has to do something. And what it does is it gets whipped around and it acts on the cohomogeneity one manifold. So it turns out that you can rewrite these associated bundles as straight up quotients of the cohomogeneity one 10 manifolds. So this sort of gives you an idea of, of what's happening. Now, I just want to point something out uh, here. So how does the diagonal S3 act? So the group, remember, is S3 cross S3 cross S3. And uh, the diagonal S3 sits inside there as the diagonal subgroup in the principal action. So it's trivial in the first factor. And Remember that a cohomogeneity one manifold is foliated by homogeneous spaces. So the U here is any of the isotropy groups. And the diagonal S3 action is just gonna act on the left of each of these homogeneous spaces. And it turns out that you can write each of these things then in a, so that's a bi-quotient, but you can turn, it turns out you can write them as bi-quotients of S3 cross S3 by just doing a little in manipulation. And the action here of the, the group U in each case, so this remember the U is either the quaternion eight group or one of the copies of pin two, and it acts on S3 cross S3 in the following way. So it's acting such that on Q1, it acts on the, on the right by U1 inverse, and on the left of Q2, by U2 and on the right by U3 inverse. So that's a, it's a nice um, action. And in, at least in the coven ziller situation, you know for free that this um, action is a free action because you already know that the quotient is a manifold. Now, the reason I wrote this down is because if you look at the, at the first coordinate there, the Q1, you can see that you can still multiply on the left by a uniquaternion. So there's still an S3 action left over that's acting on each of these individual by quotients in the quotient when you go down to the quotient space. And plus or minus one is always going to act trivially, it turns out. So what you end up with is a leftover SO3 action. So there's SO3 symmetry on the quotient space in, in these examples. And you can see where the action is. Okay, so in this way, 
you get a decomposition of these seven manifolds or a foliation of these seven manifolds by bi-quotients rather than homogeneous spaces. So it looks very similar to a homogeneity one picture, except now the foliation is by bi-quotients. I also want to point out that you still maintain this decomposition as the union of two disk bundles, which is very useful when it comes to computing the topological things, topological invariants and the like. Okay, so um, let's look at the slopes that Kolf and Ziller were working with. So remember, they were working with starting from S4. So they were forced to take a, a one in the first place. So remember, this is for uh, the slope of the circle in the pin two group sitting inside S3 cross S3 cross S3. So because they started with S4, they were forced to have a one in the first place. And then they spread the circle into the other two factors by giving it some slope. And for technical reasons, we take these parameters to be one, not four. But we've just seen that we don't care about the S4 anymore. We can just write these manifolds as straight up quotients of a 10 dimensional cohomogeneity one manifold. And so this suggests that this family of S3 bundles over S4 is actually a subfamily of a much larger family. Namely, we replace the ones with parameters and then we have to be a little careful. So taking these parameters A and B, you find a 10 dimensional cohomogeneity one manifold, no problem. It's got non-negative curvature um, because of the Kolb-Hensilla result. And if these GCD conditions hold, then the diagonal S3 action is going to be uh, free. And so the quotient is gonna be a manifold. So you'll end up with uh, a seven dimensional manifold with non-negative curvature. And so to summarize uh, the things I've said, there's a six parameter family of seven manifolds, M7, AB, such that each of these manifolds admits an SO3 invariant metric of non-negative curvature. So I've already, I hope, convinced you about the non-negative curvature and the SO3 invariants. Each of them, at least in terms of homotopy groups, looks like um, an S3 bundle over S4. It's two connected. That's pretty good. In terms of cohomology, it looks like an S3 bundle over S4. So H4 is Z mod N, where N is given by a determinant um, involving A's and B's. And I, I should point out as well that N is allowed to be zero here. And if N is equal to zero, then the cohomology is that of S3 cross S4, which is also fun. That's, that's nice and interesting. But in this talk, I'm only going to um, concentrate on the case where n is not equal to zero, and so the uh, group H4 is finite. So cohomologically, it's very like an S3 bundle over S4. And even better, seemingly, these manifolds admit a cipher vibration with generic fiber S3. So what this means is that there's an S3 bundle over an orbifold S4. So each of these manifolds is an S3 bundle over an orbifold S4, where the S4 has very mild orbifold singularity. So remember, I told you that we had this cohomogeneity one decomposition of S4, where there were two copies of RP2, and over each of them, we had a two dimensional disk bundle and we glued them together in the middle. The same thing happens here in the orbifold S4. You have two nice copies of RP2. The problem is when you go into the normal bundle, the unit circle there is too short in these examples. And you end up because of that with orbifold singularities. Okay, so these things really do look very closely similar to S3 bundles over S4. And now I'm going to try and convince you that this family is actually much, much larger than that subfamily. So first, this family contains all exotic seven spheres. So including the non-Milner spheres, the ones that cannot be written as bundles. Second, there are infinitely many members of this family which are not even homotopy equivalent to S3 bundles over S4. And remember, they all admit non-negative curvature. And these are the first examples of seven manifolds, two connected seven manifolds, with non-negative curvature, which are not a homotopy equivalent to S3 bundles over S4. So this is um, a very weird 
um, subfamily uh, within our larger six parameter family. Okay. And so now let's think about some familiar friends um, which were mentioned in the, in the abstract. And I might not get um, time to talk about these at the end. So I, let me just say a few words about them now and, and we'll see how we get on for time. So inside the SO3 um, action on, on our seven manifolds, if you take a cyclic group, Z mod D, you can check for freeness of this action. So it's going to be an isometric action and you want to know when it's free. And it turns out you can find uh, GCD conditions involving D and the parameters A and B, which determine when the action is free. In fact, it turns out that if the action is free, then D has to be odd. But that's just a, an observation in, in, the, in hindsight, if you like. Um, in particular, if the seven manifolds, uh, if the seven manifold that you're looking at is a homotopy sphere, then the quotient that you get is called a fake lens space. And so these are the first examples to appear in the literature of fake lens spaces in any dimension with non-negative curvature. Now, it turns out that when I was preparing a version of this talk um, a couple of months ago, um, I went digging around in, in some of the literature to understand fake lens spaces a bit better. And um, if you put together some very old work of Orlik, I think in the 60s, with some of the observations of Hof and Ziller, and some of the Breezecorn constructions of the five sphere, then you can show that there are also five dimensional fake lens spaces which admit non negative curvature. But that's not written down anywhere. Um, but um, it's, certainly, it's certainly true. So even though this is the first time anything, any fake lens spaces have appeared in the literature, if you dig around enough, you can see that in combining certain things, you can find other examples in dimension five. Okay. So that's good. These are kind of interesting. By the way, fake lens space means that, um, so a, a, a regular lens space is the quotient of a, a sphere by a linear Z mod N action. And a fake lens space is what happens if the action isn't linear. And another corollary is, well, I told you that the, the um, fundamental groups for these fake, fake lens spaces, if you take sub-actions of SO3 are um, of odd order, you can also find a Z mod two action on all of the seven manifolds and it's always free. And if the seven manifold were a sphere, a homotopy sphere, then the quotient is called, oops, then the quotient is called the homotopy RP7. And there are at least um, 28 um, oriented homotopy types of these. So one for each homotopy seven sphere, oriented homotopy seven sphere. Um, at least with this construction. Now, I suspect this is exactly 28 for this construction because at least for the Milner spheres, it is known that um, no matter which representation of the Milner sphere you take within our family, um, the, within, sorry, the S3 bundles of S4, you only obtain uh, a single um, diffeomorphism type of the homotopy RP7 um, when you take the quotient by this uh, involution. So what is this involution? Um, I told you that each of these manifolds is essentially a bundle over some orbifold S4, oops, orbifold S4. Um, if you think about it, the SO3 action, if you dig into the details of the construction, the SO3 action is actually on the, on the four dimensional base of these orbifold dose. And the Z mod two action is the antipodal map on the fiber. So if you're dealing with um, the S3 bundles over S4, this all, um, you don't have to be careful at all. Everything is, is um, coming directly out of the construction, but um, with these orbifold bundles, you just have to be a little bit careful, but this is essentially what's going on. So you see that the Z mod two doesn't live inside the SO3, but you can combine um, these two actions, and you can get um, you can get cyclic group actions of order two D as well for any D odd. 
providing the GCD conditions are satisfied. Okay, so you get familiar friends appearing or fake versions of familiar friends with non-negative curvature. So those are also very interesting. They have very interesting topology. There are many open questions, but uh, I probably won't have much time to talk about them anymore. So let me go on and talk about the first two corollaries. So I'll try and convince you now that all of the non-Milner spheres are contained in our six parameter family. So in order to do this, we need to compute the, um, the east Kuiper invariant. And the east Kuiper invariant is, is defined for all two connected um, rational um, seven spheres, um, rational cohomology seven spheres. And the east Kuiper invariant looks like this. And remember I said, I'm assuming that H4 has a finite order, so n is not equal to zero. It looks like this, and it looks pretty daunting. So before I try and talk to you about this, I want to say what W in this, in the right-hand side of that expression is. W is supposed to be a compact, smooth, oriented spin eight manifold whose boundary is R7 manifold that we're interested in. And if I now look at this expression here in the box, this, if W were a closed manifold, this would be the so-called A hat genus of the manifold. So if the boundary were trivial, this would be the A hat genus. And this is a well-known uh, invariant for, for spin manifolds. And in particular, for eight manifolds, spin eight manifolds, this is known to be an integer by an old result of Herzog law. So the right-hand side of this yields Kuiper invariant is essentially trying to compute the A hat genus of an eight manifold with binary, boundary. And it's throwing away the integer part when you take things in Q mod Z. So it's kind of measuring the defect of the A hat genus from being an integer due to the fact that the manifold has boundary. And it turns out that when you take everything mod one, what you get is actually independent of the choice of the eight manifold. So it doesn't matter what you choose for W, as long as the boundary is M, you'll get the same thing coming out. And this is the ease Kuiper invariant. So what do the other terms mean? The J here is an isomorphism you get in the long exact cohomology sequence for the pair with rational coefficients, uh, due to the fact that the seven manifold is a rational sphere. So you get an, an isomorphism for free. And using this isomorphism, you can pull the first contraeigen class, the first rational contraeigen class for the manifold W back to the pair, where it typically doesn't make any sense. And then you square it to get it to the top degree and apply it to the fundamental class for the pair. And this gives you a nice rational number. And the sigma here is the signature of the pair. And there's nothing mysterious about this either. What you do is you take any old class in the fourth rational cohomology of the pair, you square it, get into the top degree, you apply it to a fundamental class. This defines a, a symmetric bilinear form. And so you can compute the signature of this symmetric bilinear form, and that's called the, the signature of the pair. And so this, um, uh, all the terms there are, are sort of standard in topological invariance. The problem is that you don't know in general which W to pick. So if you have an S3 bundle over S4, it's pretty obvious which co-boundary you choose. But for the general man manifolds in our family, we have no idea which, which Ws to choose. And so this isn't a very useful description of the invariant. However, I told you that it depends really only on the boundary M. So you might hope to be able to rewrite this entire expression just in terms of M, and you can do that, but you have to pay a price. So what you do is you uh, equip the manifold M with, with, with the metric, some background metric, GM, then you have, Pick your favorite co-boundary, so abstractly one exists at least. You extend the metric into this co-boundary. 
so that it's a nice product near the boundary M. And then you apply the Tia-Pitotti Singer index theorem for uh, manifolds with boundary, for eight manifolds with boundary. And uh, then using work of Kreck and Stolz and Donnelly, you can derive uh, an alternative formula for the East Kuiper invariant of M, just involving the geometry of M with this background metric GM that I, that I uh, mentioned. Now I should maybe say that this background metric is not the same metric that has non-negative curvature. This background metric is chosen so that the computation of each of these terms um, becomes tractable. So what are these actual terms? So the D here is the usual spin Dirac operator on your seven manifold. B is the so-called odd signature operator on the seven manifold. And this is given by taking the commutator of the differential with the Hodge star operator applied to differential forms of even degree on your manifold. Okay, so because the Hodge star operator depends on the metric, this, uh, this is something that depends on the metric. And both of these guys are um, operators of Dirac type. That means when you square them, they look like Laplacians. HD in this formula is the dimension of the kernel of the spin Dirac operator. And the eta here is the eta invariant of an operator of Dirac type. So I told you that that means that when you square the operator, it looks like a Laplacian. And so the eta invariant is the price you pay in the in the Atiyah Singer index theorem for a manifold having a boundary. So the, the boundary version of the Atiyah Singer index theorem is the Atiyah Patodi Singer index theorem. And the, the defect term that occurs in that theorem is called the A10 variant. Alternatively, given that the squares of these operators look like Laplacians, you know that the spectra um, of the operators are uh, consist of real numbers. And so the A10 variant can also be viewed as a measure of the asymmetry of the eigenvalues of your operators around the origin. So they have real spectra. Okay, so this is um, sort of a standard geometric analytic object. It's not easy to compute by any manner of means, but it's well studied. The P1 inside the integral here is the Chernvay uh, Pontryagin 4 form that you construct from the curvature 2 form. And the P1 hat is a 3 form whose differential is the Chernvay 4 form. And you know such a 3 form exists because we're dealing with rational seven spheres. So the fourth rational, the fourth Dirac cohomology group is trivial. So you know that uh, some such three form has to exist. Okay, so uh, that's what all those terms mean. That's a, a nice uh, formula for the is kuiper invariant in terms of just the geometry of M with respect to some metric. Uh, and then the hard work starts because you have to compute all, all of these things. And that is uh, really not fun. So I'm not going to talk about that at all. I'm just going to tell you what the East Kuiper invariant is. So you get this nice um, rational expression at the front. I'll tell you in a moment what M is. And then you get uh, sort of two um, slightly pro problematic terms, dA and dB. So one for each half of the disk bundle decomposition of your manifold. And you take everything mod one, as usual. So N, remember, is the order of H4 that's given in terms of the A's and B's. M is also a determinant in terms of the A's and B's, but it typically it's just a rational number rather than an integer. And the DA and the DB are generalized Dedekind sums. So they're complicated rational functions in, in sines and cosines in, involving the parameters A and B. And these see the fact that your manifold is not the total space of a bundle. So they're seeing the orbifold singularities in the in the uh, leaf space of your cipher vibration. So this orbifold S4. So they're detecting the failure of your, of your manifold from being the total space of a true bundle. However, one half of your manifold may be a true disk bundle over half of S4. And in that case, the, the generalized Dedekind sum term would vanish. So that's uh, sometimes very useful. So here's some uh, explicit one parameter 
family of examples. So we take the parameters a to be minus three, minus three, one, and b to be one LL, where L is one mod four as usual. So the first thing maybe I'll say is because a one is not equal to one, we're not talking about an S3 bundle over S4. So we're away from the, the Kolfziller situation. Um, on the other hand, because we have a one here, the half corresponding to the, to the B parameter, it does look like a true bundle. So the, the dedicant sum term for this half is actually gonna vanish. So that's gonna be nice. Okay, so you plug in to the definition of N to determine the order of, of H4. It turns out N is minus one. So H4 is going to be Z mod minus one. So it's going to be trivial which means that your manifold is homeomorphic to uh, seven. Now it could be that we've just discovered the standard sphere in many complicated ways. So we need uh, to actually compute the, the e squared invariant to, to figure out what exactly we found here. The nice thing about these parameters is I told you that taking B1 to be equal to one means that the, the dedicant sum term there um, doesn't cause a problem, it vanishes. But choosing a minus three here, it means that you can compute the dedicant sum term on the other half by hand because all of the cosine and sine terms involved become cosines and sines of multiples of pi over three. And those are objects, of course, that we well understand. So this is one of the few occasions where we can compute everything by hand for these dedicant sum terms. And then you plug in to the formula up above and you get that the yield Kuiper invariant is nine over 56 times L squared minus one over eight times L squared minus one over eight plus one. Now remember, L is one mod four. So this is an integer. So that means you're multiplying nine over 56 by consecutive integers. So one of those is even. So you end up with something over 28. And this is exactly what you expect because we have some manifold as homeomorphic to S7 and there are 28 of these things. So you're expecting to get your yield squared invariant to be something over 28. And that's what we do. So here are the lowest values of L in absolute value that give the numerators corresponding to the non-Milner exotic seven spheres. And of course, um, there are infinitely many Ls um, which are one mod four, which, which hit each of these things. So they each occur infinitely often within this one parameter family. Okay, so let me now, in the last um, about five, seven minutes, I think, talk about the, the second corollary. So I want to convince you now that this family is much, much larger than the um, S3 bundles over S4. So it's um, got these um, non-standard homotopy types. So we're gonna to have to compute a different topological invariant. And the invariant we need this time is the so-called linking form, which is a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form. And the, it's easiest to define it if we use Poincaré duality and talk instead about um, homology. So let's take the third homology group and take a product with itself and we're going to define the linking form to be a map into Q mod Z given by taking two homology classes in degree three, alpha and beta, and um, computing some oriented intersection number for the, from these two classes, dividing by the order of H upper four or H lower three, so Z mod N, and take, taking everything mod one. So what is this oriented intersection form? What is the gamma alpha that appears in there? So if you think of these two um, alpha and beta, so you have, you have two classes here of degree three. And you know that because you're in a torsion group, if you take n times one of them, it has to be the boundary of something. So n times alpha is the boundary of something. So that, that something is gonna be four dimensional, degree four. So it's gonna intersect with beta in some finite number of points. Uh, I should say this object here is the gamma alpha. So this co-boundary of the n times alpha. 
Um, beta, of course, can be given some orientation. If you think of it as a, if you think of everything as in terms of submanifolds, uh, it's maybe easier. So these things can be given orientations, and um, at any intersection point, the orientations either add up to the orientation of the total space or the ambient space, or they're the opposite orientation. And according to which you have, you you get a plus or one, a plus one or a minus one, and you add up all of these plus and minus ones, and that's the uh, oriented intersection number corresponding to alpha and beta. And it doesn't matter um, which of these alpha or beta you multiply by n. It doesn't matter which co-boundary of either you, you choose because you're taking everything mod one. So that, that um, makes sure that the, all of these choices involved in the definition don't actually play any role. So that's a pretty intuitive a definition of the linking form. Of course, it's useless if I give you a particular manifold and ask you to compute its linking form. So that's definitely not how you compute it, um, but um, it's enough to give the, some sense of what the linking form is. So the linking form is said to be standard if you can find some generator of your Z mod N, such that when you apply the linking form to it, what you get is up to a sign the square of a multiplicative unit divided by the order of your Z mod N. So I should just point out that the, um, so the bilinearity means you only have to care about what happens to a generator. And the non-degeneracy means that the numerator is always going to be a multiplicative unit. So the point is the we're interested in a situation when we're talking about standard where this multiplicative unit is a square. So let me just give you a very simple example. Um, so imagine that H4 or H lower three is Z mod five. So I'm dealing with the lag again, so I'm um, going to be a little slow with writing this. Um, okay, so suppose that your linking form were given by two over five. So the linking of some generator of Z mod five with itself were two over five. Well, you know, of course, that the multiplicative units in Z mod five, which are squares, are one and four. Just square them all. And you see it um, immediately. And of course, you know that plus or minus two mod five are not in this set. So this linking form is not standard. So this is the sort of thing that we're going to be looking for in a moment, and I'll tell you why. But the key point is that minus four, or sorry, four, namely minus one mod five, is a square. So it turns out that the key point when we're looking for these non-standard linking forms turns out to be finding situations where minus one is a square mod n. So you're really talking about quadratic reciprocities when, you, when you're looking for these um, non-standard linking forms. So what has this got to do with our non-negative curvature family? So there's a theorem of Kitchell and Shankar, which adapted to our situation says that uh, the manifold M7AB is homotopy equivalent to an S3 bundle over S4, if and only if the linking form is standard. So we are looking for non-standard linking forms. In among our manifolds. So that's why I used the term non standard before when I talked about the corollary. Okay, so this is the linking form. I'm not going to tell you how to compute it. You use the cohomology de definition, which, um, which is defined in terms of the Bockstein homomorphism, and you use strongly the uh, decomposition as a union of two disk bundles, and you do lots of very subtle diagram chasing, and you can compute this. So it's, it's an elementary um, algebraic topology in a complicated way, I'll put it that way. So the linking form of some generator is plus or minus Q over N, where the Q depends on A and B as follows. So um, you can see clearly the, de the uh, dependence on B and the R and S depend on A because they come out of the Euclidean algorithm applied to the A's. Remember we had these GCD conditions on the A's and the B's. Uh, which had certain, we're saying that certain things were co-prime. So using this and applying the, the Euclidean algorithm gives us some R and S. And um, we, this gives us the R and S in the in Q. 
and you can change, you can switch the roles of the A and B in these uh, two expressions. The linking form is still the same, nothing changes because you're taking everything mod one. So here are some examples. If you take a prime that's one mod four, then you can always find an example within our family where P squared divides the order of the group and such that the linking form is not standard. So straight away, there are infinitely many of these examples. And it turns out, by the way, that this is a necessary condition, that the order is divisible by the square of a prime. Um, because if the GCD of A1 and oops, B1 is one, okay, it's catching up with me, okay then this always means that the linking form is standard. Uh, I have written something, I thought it's coming, there you go. So the linking form is always standard if A1 and B1 are uh, co-prime. So in order to find examples with non-standard linking form, you need A1 and B1 to have some common divisor. And if you go back to the definition of the order N, it was the determinant which involved um, A1 and B1, and uh, you'll see that any common divisor is going to factor out as a square. Okay, so, um, by the way, that also shows that the example, the, the simple example I gave you with CMOD5 does not um, occur inside our family. So there are uh, examples of seven manifolds that look like S3 bundles over S4 with non-standard linking form, which are not covered by our family. So our family isn't exhaustive, which is maybe even more interesting than anything else I've told you. So it would be really cool to, to find a description of these other manifolds as well. So here, uh, just to finish up, is a, an explicit um, example. So take any prime that is five mod eight and take the parameters A to be P one minus three and B to be P minus three five. Then you compute that the order of H4 is P squared. You can find a generator such that the linking form is up to a sign given by two over P squared. And this is always non-standard. And the reason is because of a classical theorem in quadratic reciprocities, which says that plus or minus two are, is a square mod P if and only if P is not uh, five mod eight. So the odd prime P is not five mod eight. And that's exactly um, uh, the situation we're not in. Okay, so that's, uh, without going on to the other crawl race, that's everything I wanted to say. So let's stop. <laughs>